Thanks, Kara. You didn't, however, forget to mention I was president of my fifth grade class twi twice. Okay, I'm going to set me a little timer here so that I can keep on track because we do have a tremendous amount to cover in a relatively short period of time. So I'm going to start it. There we go. Uh, again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to have a conversation with you this morning. We have a tremendous amount to cover, and I'm hoping um, that over the course of the next 30 minutes, we can have an, an open and honest conversation about, um, about our industry. Like I said, I, I've been in this business for 33 years. This is my 33rd year in higher education. And, and I can tell you, and many of you, I, I would imagine, would agree with me, I, I have never seen so much change, certainly in the last 24 months, as we have seen. Everything, as you know, from the, the MOOCs and so, uh, of last year, and we'll get into some of those, but just the pressure and the, uh, that's coming from, from all different angles. And we're going to talk ab about that as we, as we move forward this morning. Um, this is a little cartoon that you'll understand uh, uh, in a second what, where we're going with this. Um, but let me, let me tell you where I hope we can go together this morning. Um, I'm going to share with you my thoughts and predictions. Um, there, I have no crystal ball. Uh, I am merely trying to connect the dots and have been doing that, I think, for a, a while. And I'm going to share with you my thoughts and my predictions. And then I'm going to tell you what I think are the solutions going forward as this, this, this industry that I love is changing, or what I refer to to drive this metaphor home and pr principally to death today, the, the exit ramps uh, of, of the great American higher education highway. And then at the end, what I want to do is I want to stop and I want you to tell me your thoughts, um, be it this morning or throughout the next two days. Uh, and more importantly, I want you to tell me where I'm wrong. Because I, 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 I don't know if you'll find another person in this room that wants to be more wrong, if you will, than me. I, I, the, the connections and the dots that I'm going to connect for you, um, on the one hand, are pretty challenging. I end with optimism, so <laughs> there, is, there is really good things coming. Uh, but, but I want to hear from you about where I'm wrong, because um, it's important to me, it's important to all of us that, that we do that. So that's the direction that I want to do in the next 30 minutes. I, I do want to share with you two core beliefs, however. Um, and that is, I believe that history does repeat itself. Now, I know we talk about that. You hear that all the way through grade school, that the history repeats itself. I, I believe that from a lot of different reasons. So I'm going to show you history. I'm going to show you a history going back, in some cases, perhaps 75 years. That what we're experiencing today, we can begin to project based on some history. Now, you may look at this history and say, nah, that, that's it, that's it. Two plus two, I think two plus two is four. You may say, nah, no, two plus two is six. We can have that conversation of how you got to your numbers. But I'm a, I, I do believe history repeats itself. And it's the only way we know where we're going with this. And the second thing I, I should share up, you, up here is that higher education is a business. It, it isn't a for, in many cases, for many institutions, it isn't a for-profit business. So we have for-profit companies and we have for-profit institutions out there. But I, for 11 years, I worked for the college board where I had a president who said, uh, we may not be a for-profit organization. We may not be in the business to make money, but we surely are not in the business to lose money. And so the, the key uh, it, here is that the suggestions and exits that I discuss are important because you cannot continue to lose money. When the president, I'm sorry, when the CFO of Harvard says, as he did several months ago in a, in a quote in the Chronicle, that they have to change their business model, that their business model is unsustainable, what does that mean for the rest of us? And so. One of my favorite authors, George Orwell, said this, and I like to start off with, he said, at any given moment, there are all sorts of all, a source of all prevailing orthodoxy, a general tacit agreement not to discuss some large and uncomfortable facts. Well, this morning, what I hope to do is to discuss some of those large and uncomfortable facts, because we can't understand, I believe, how we got here or where we're going unless we figured out how we got here. And here's a, a chart. Some of you may have saw this, uh, seen this in, in the, in the uh, Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago. This, to me, is merely the symptoms. 
This doesn't tell us at all what the causes are and certainly what the, the antidote is. That's what we're going to talk about today. This is, this is what the public sees. This is what your neighbors always talk about. And what's interesting here to me is not you know, the, 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 the curve, which is obviously out of control. Um, much of this, some of this self-inflicted, self -inflicted, some of it externally inflicted upon our, our industry. But what's interesting to me here is that in these other areas, food, medical care, the public has, over the last 10, 15 years, has responded to that, has taken control of those issues. So for example, small example with food. When food prices continue to rise, what do we do? We came up with Costco's, we came up with BJ's. People gravitated. Some, some of my wife doesn't shop anywhere but BJ's these days. Because the food prices, she gets a better deal there. Same was happening with medical costs. When employers couldn't afford medical costs, what did they respond? They responded long before the Affordable, Hair, uh, Affordable Care Act, they created HMOs. Higher education, I believe, as we go through this discussion, I think are going to, if, if we do not control our destiny, if we do not take control, if we don't come up with the cure, if you will, the public, we have known through history, will, will do that for us. Take a look at some of these. Just in the last couple months, take a look at some of the headlines that we see here. Just to give a, a snapshot of, of the challenges that we face as an industry. You know, Sally May survey finds families unwilling to pay more for higher education. You've seen some of these. Moody's, negative outlook for higher education. Just to, just to take a few of these quotes. Expanding burden of tuition debt is partially driven by indebtedness the universities have taken on. Look at, this was just last week. Debt service payments have risen 86% from 202 to 210 to 2010. That's that Taj Mahal dorm that we had to have. That's that 55-person hot tub that we had to have in order to get those students, all those discussions. That's what that is. I come from New Jersey. Well, I should say I come from New Jersey. I live in New Jersey. I just live over Philadelphia, over uh, across the way in New Jersey. And last week, um, there was a big story about New Jersey. It's $65 billion in, in their, pen, their, their pension system is in debt, $65 billion. And the governor is not going to make another payment this year to that. That pension system is going to come back. And, all this, and much of that debt is, is capital for college universities. New Jersey just approved a $1.7 billion two years voters capital improvement plan to build buildings on college universities. Debt is, is incredible. I love this quote here. <clears throat> One has to wonder if American higher education is the proverbial frog in the slowly warming pot of water, not realizing what's about to boil. I think people in this room understand that. Take a look at a couple of other uh, within the last 12 months. Here, for those of us that are looking at uh, online learning as, as a way of, 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 of saving our institution, or for those of you who are looking at, at the international market, here's an article that came out last week. Education trends in East Asia could disrupt flow of students to the U.S. And I love this quote here, and I don't love it, it's a fact. Nearly half of the nation's college universities are no longer generating enough tuition and revenue to keep pace with inflation. That's scary stuff. Last slide about what's going on here. So again, within the last 12 months, in some cases within the last week, Harrisburg University misses bond payment. Moody downgraded. Vermont colleges, from those of you who are up here, know this as well. And you know, one of the analysts from from, uh, from Moody's had this quote in the Chronicle a few weeks ago, which I think really sums up. She said, uh, Fitzgerald said, common factor nearly all of the recent downgrades by Moody's has less to do with finances and more to do with leadership. Quote, weak governance and weak management play a key role, she says, particularly in the disruptive period when colleges face mounting demands to control costs, improve quality, and adapt a new academic model. It's leadership. It's leadership. It's college presidents who are as concerned about their current institution as they are about their next institution. It's taking that leadership. It's the leadership in this room and other organizations that have to step up the plate. And we're going to talk about what that means, in my opinion. Again, I'm going to throw it back to you about what that leadership is. Now, but, but in order for us to understand, I think, where we need to go, I think it's critical for us to figure out, to take a look at the past. Because how do we figure out where we're going unless we understand what got us here? And I want to share with you just a few of the things, my past. This was the first book I wrote 17 years ago. Oh, yes, The Internet Guide to College Bound Students. And when this came out back in 1996, most people thought, most people thought of the Internet as AOL. You know, if you were, people say, are you in the Internet? You mean AOL? 
No, 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 the internet, yeah, AOL, that's what it is, isn't it? That was the old days of, remember this, the old 14.4 baud modems? Oh, <laughs> who'd ever forget the old 14, I mean, missed, and then when it went to 28.8, you were like the king in your neighborhood. Who misses that old beep noisy, you know, the beep, mm, mm, mm. missed the old dial-up days. This book talked about, um, you know, had some really wild concepts back at the time, like Talnet and Gophers and FTP. And, there, and I wrote a chapter back then about this thing called the World Wide Web. And I said, uh, by 1999 or sooner, all college uh, 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 institutions will be expected online. college bound students will now tap into the vast amount of insight information that's not available. When this came out, I got more threatening letters. I was working for the college board at the time from deans of admissions saying, in fact, there's one Ivy League dean that called for my, for my head. He said, how dare you write a book showing students how to find the email addresses of our alumni, how to find the email addresses of our faculty. We don't want prospective students emailing our faculty. We don't even know what they're going to say. And I said back then, you're right. You're right. You can no longer control the message. This made, by the way, uh, a full page story in USA Today that year when this book came out. Revolutionized you know, what things were going to do. So I followed up with that with an article in NACAC, and some of you I know are NACAC members, uh, a year later called uh, Advice to Schools, a Wake-Up Call to Colleges. And I said, look, this is coming. It's going to fundamentally change. Now this is 18 years. It's gonna, you need to wake up. This is going to change the way students look at you, the way students learn, the way teachers teach. The technology is coming. And people laughed and said, ah, oh, that's craziness. They're never going to do that. The computers will never be, schools will never have the internet. Stop, be quiet, Ken, sit down. So several years later, wrote several years of articles. Fast forward to 1999. A good friend of mine, Kristen Betts, who uh, hopefully is in the audience here, is a senior fellow, and I rewrote this piece called Reexamining, this is in the Sloan Journal, Reexamining Reposition Higher Education, 20 Economic and 20 Demographic Factors Driving Online Learning Learning in, in the winter of 19, in 2009. And again, my friends and, and workers said, oh, here he goes again with this debt thing and this whole business about technology and the control and the skyrocketing cost. Eh, enough with the doom and gloom. This is never going to happen, Ken. So, well, I stuck to it. And last year, some of you may have seen this essay I wrote called The, 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 uh, the No-Wake Syndrome. And I said, future economic and political circumstances will fundamentally change the role of college presidents from one building uh, uh, more buildings and growing endowments to one leading advocate for fundamental transformation of their institution. And again, last year, and I, and I actually had my first shot at, a, at, a, at, a, at an illustration. I, I didn't do it. I did the little stick characters, and I had some kid dry it off me. But I, 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 but I included this in my essay, Insider Education. And, and, and if you go online, you can see what people had to say. But people came up to me and said, again, this was last year, oh, here you go again. You know? <laughs> We've had times in our nation's history where we've had decreased uh, federal funding, state funding, where inflation has been high. All those clouds you see out there, because this as a result of the silly MOOC stuff that I was driving me crazy with everybody talking about how MOOCs were going to fundamentally transform higher education. And, 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 and you know, uh, someone described 2013 as the decade of the MOOCs, because everything written about MOOCs. Well, they say, There's, uh, we've had students who have debt problems, and of course we've been at war before, so what's the big deal here, Ken? And I would say to them, and I, say, and I would say to you, that that's true. Many of these elements, many of these clouds, we have had in our nation's history in the past. But never at the same time. That's the difference. Never at the same time. So, um, that's the past. Moving forward now, let's take a look at uh, some Edge Adventures data. You can't come to an Edge Adventures conference without looking at Edge Adventures because I think this is very instructive to where we need to go, what these exits look like. And eventually, we're going to get to the exits. Exit one, exit two, exit three, and I'm going to try and explain to you my thoughts about what these exits are going to look like and, and urge you to take one of these exits. As an institution, you got to take an exit. you got to get off the road. But if we take a look at uh, some numbers that we recently published about online learning, Particularly those of you who, and I spent a lot of time on the phone and on campus working with, with, with you guys on your e-learning strategy, or either growing it or starting it. What was interesting here is we see for the, for the, the market in general, it's, it's very interesting. It's fairly flat right now. Same is true, as you know, with the traditional age market. Actually, that's going down. We're projecting very flat numbers for online learning. But then you see that bump going out around 2000, 2020, and growth. Small caveat here. 
and you'll see when we get into a couple of our slides in a second, that growth may occur, but it can't be with the same product that we're currently serving up to students. More about that in a second. So you do see some of there. And again, uh, you have many of the big players, many of, particularly the for-profit players who have really gobbled up the, the vast majority of this market. It really, up until 2006, really Phoenix was the big, uh, but now everybody's offering online courses. And so just, and the big players are the, are the ones that are, are, are getting the vast majority of students. So to think that, for example, that all you have to do is offer an online program and somehow you're gonna be able to compete, I don't think that's the case anymore. When I started uh, at Drexel, we could just throw a net out there and catch lots of fish, because we were an early player in the market. And we grew very, very quickly. Those days are over for institutions. It's a different type, and we're going to talk about that in a second, a different type of strategy. I thought this was interesting from that same report. If you take a look at traditional age kids, 18 to 24, I know our enrollment management folks are interested in this. Uh, and you take a look at what their preferences are. And this is a preference study we did this past year. This shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, especially those of us that have children. I have a 22-year-old and a, and a, that just graduated from college and a, and a 19-year-old daughter going on 25 uh, who is a sophomore at the University of Delaware. And, uh, you know, they still, 18, 19 year still want that face-to-face that -face experience. I mean, they want to meet boys. They want to meet girls. I don't think that's going to change much going forward. I, again, I could be wrong. I'll throw it back to you. But what's more interesting to me is the adult population. Back in 19, way back in 2006, boy, it seems like it was a long time ago, um, you know, adults, there was a different market. The adult learner wanted convenience. They wanted um, online for, uh, because they had a, a, a job that required they get a degree completion and move on, and, that, and that's it. I think that wave of the huge waves that the, that the for-profits really took well advantage of at the time, I think that market is starting to change now. You're starting to see these adult learners say, you know, maybe I don't want a fully online experience. I, mean, I want some kind of blended hybrid experience because if I want to go see my instructor, if I need to talk to the person in financial aid, I can drive. And we find that most students, as, as many of you know, our online students are somewhere within 100 to 150 mile radius of the institution they're attending. They still want that. And I don't think that's going to change. Uh, if you look at adult learners, you see, again, you have adult learners starting to shift. I mentioned before, really post-2006. And you see a larger percentage of them wanting some sort of hybrid experience. They don't want to come every day to class. They can't come every day to class. But they would like a degree program that allows, gives them the flexibility of, of, of that. And I think ultimately, as you begin to plan your programs of study, these numbers become very important. OK, so let's talk about those students. today. Today's students and tomorrow's students. Now, today's students, uh, and, and certainly those of you who are interested in growing your online program, uh, online is no longer a differential. Everybody offers online. I remember if, years ago, all you had to do was put a, you know, a sign out that said, anywhere, anytime, and, and they would come. That's no longer the case. The market is saturated. There are far too many uh, 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 players and far too many students now, so the competition is, is, is intense. And oftentimes, when I'm visiting institutions, they ask about, well, how much money am I going to spend to get these students? Is $3,000 a student? $5,000 a student? Four thousand? What is? What's my marketing spend? And my answer to them is, you can't, you can't throw enough marketing money. It's not about marketing anymore. It's not about spend. It's the, the consumers are becoming much more savvy, and they're demanding much more in the future. Talking PowerPoint slides are not going to cut it in the future. Right now, they will. Right now they will, because that's pretty much what we have out there when it comes to the content and product that we're delivering, talking PowerPoint slides. I just finished a um, two days of work, well, actually two days out of campus, with a community college not far from here, evaluating their online courses. You know, there, there's, there, there, there's a lot of challenges ahead for these institutions. And what's it going to mean down the road? This is what I believe consumers are going to want to pay for. This is what 18-year-olds and what 25-year-olds are going to want. They're going to want a, 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 a product, a degree, with transformative pedagogy, with compelling outcomes, at a substantially reduced cost, a better product at a cheaper price. Now, many people in higher education say that that's impossible. I don't think so, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. They want to be engaged. They want adaptive learning. They want a scalable 
degree program. They want to be able to stop, they want to start perhaps with a, a, a course, maybe not even a course, but a badge, but they want stackable degrees in many instances. So we may, may start with a two-week course that gives us a badge or whatever you want to call it, or what we'll call five years from now, that leads perhaps to a, a course that leads to a certificate, that leads to a bachelor's degree, that leads to a master's degree, and let them stack that. Give them credit for what they know, uh, particularly at the graduate level, and they will come. They want the mobility, obviously. Uh, if we, we could do a show of hands here, how many people are tweeting and how many people are on their cell phone, they want that thing. So it, it amazes me how many colleges I'm at right now that still don't have a website that is optimized for, uh, for a, 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 a mobile device. It's just not respecting adult learners' time. And I used to say when I was president of Drexel University Online to our folks, respect their time, because that's all they have to give you. Respect their time. Don't make them hunt things on our website. Don't make them go fill out anything more than they have to on the, on the application. Respect their time, because their time is very busy. And we all know with what life is throwing at us these days, we don't have much time. They want career opportunities. They want to be able to interact and network with folks. Here's where I think online university or online education is and where it's going to go. Right now, as an industry, I believe we're down here in the bottom. We're doing easy stuff, the talking PowerPoint slide. That's not where the industry wants to go. It's not where students, where they want to go is top right hand corner over here with the compelling outcomes. That's hard to do in a cost money. It doesn't come cheap. You go to a company like Tata, for example, and have them design a course for you, it's going to cost you $100,000. So it's not coming cheap. I think as an industry, this is where we are right now with online. Remember that phone? Yeah, that was a great one. I actually had the box phone before this, so this was a big, big advancement. I think as an industry, we're talking about talking PowerPoint side, the people, particularly your 18, 19 year old kids, look at this as where we are right now. What's going to set you apart as an institution is having the iPhone of, of, of education, both on campus as well as face to face. So how do we do that? Because it's time to, to make those changes. And let's take a look at um, the, let's take a look at the, the, uh, the role we have here. And again, it's up to you which, which one you're going to take, but I urge you, I plead with you to take X and one. So what does X and one look like? With all those problems we were talking about before, Take a look at the articles again. You know, here's uh, St. Joe's is going through a tremendous amount. The Chronicle reported that last year it was a record number of non uh, no confidence votes in universities. <laughs> and St. Joe's, the other day, they, they voted no confidence in the director of financial aid. <laughs> Where'd that come from? You know, then they moved to the uh, vice president from Roman and finally to the president. So they're getting everybody at St. Joe's. Again, trying to shoot, and the quote that I had in the Inside Higher Education that day was, the president's in the watchtower. Presidents can't run anymore. They're in the watchtower. They have to take advantage of that. This is fascinating to me about the debt we're in. No such explosion that has ever escaped the days of reckoning. We are right now, uh, as a nation, we are, are uh, somewhere around... Um, $120 trillion in debt. With quantitative easing, more about that in a second. Uh, we have printed in the last uh, uh, six years nearly $2 trillion of funny money, quantitative easing. As a nation, no nation in the history of the world, no nation in the history of the world has ever been more in debt than the United States of America today. We are printing money at a tune of $65 billion a month. And the one thing we know is that it has to stop. It has to stop. Every economist, but every time the Federal Reserve Chair, woman in this case, but chairmen before would say, we're going to have to stop. We're going to have to do what we need to do, which is to suck that money out of the system. And the only way you suck that money out of the system is by raising interest rates. Every economist will tell you that. When interest rates rise, which they will, what will that do to your institution? What would that do to your institution's ability to borrow? What would that do to your institution's ability to refinance your debt, et cetera, et cetera? To say nothing of your customer base, of parents and so forth. So the interest rates, well, we have to move as a nation. The last country to do this was the Weimar Republic in 1923. And we know what happened to those guys. It did not end well. So exit one means you've got to start off with it, it, to take the assessment, it starts with an open and honest conversation with your constituents, presidents, trustees, 
talking about where we're facing right now, talking about that we are in uncharted waters as a nation and as an industry, and status quo just won't cut it. And the easy things, increasing your retention, improving your pathways, the stackable degrees, looking at bold cost reductions and things that are not core to your mission that can be outsourced to others. Teaching policies that lead, you can't have a professor who's making $150,000 teaching one class. At most institutions, it will not work. You have to look at, and again, the, the, the pedagogy. That's what, that's the easy stuff. If you do not want to take the easy stuff as an institution and you want to fly right by exit number one, fair game. Here's exit number two. Exit number two becomes a lot harder. Take a look at some of these quotes again in the Chronicle. Student loan debt, again, which will be piling up. $1.1 trillion is the fastest pace in debt category. So here's what you do at exit two. First thing, exit two becomes a lot more uh, difficult for a college leader because you have to explain to your constituents why the hell you went right past exit number one. He just flew right by it. So now you got to explain to him, well, uh, I didn't do that because of what? You didn't tell me because of what? This thing just came up overnight? No, it didn't. No, it didn't. You knew that. You didn't have the courage to tell your constituents what the problem was. So it starts with an open, honest discussion, and you don't care about the non-confidence votes, the no-confidence votes. You have very few options here because you're running out of money, and I'll show you examples of that, and you're going to need capital because now students are leaving your institution. They're not coming here because they don't see the product of, of any quality. They don't see the return on their investment, and they're hearing about your debt uh, and your credit rating beginning to lower. If you think exit two gets tough, exit three really sucks because here you have the situation where lawmakers begin to question whether or not you really should be in business. Here's a quote that was in New Jersey just the other day. This is two days ago in the Philadelphia Inquirer. There's a law pending in New Jersey saying that one of the most controversial bills which would require closing four-year colleges that do not achieve a six-year graduation rate of at least 50%. I got to tell you a conversation I had uh, with a banker uh, the other day. And this really, again, I've been in this business for a long time. This really knocked me off my chair. I got a call about two months ago from a banker of a bank that, of a major bank that I don't need to mention the name, but you know it if I mention it, International Bank. And they have a lot of debt in U.S. college universities. They own a lot of capital. They built your buildings. And he called and said, Ken, we're, we're a little tired of what's going on right now. He said, we have a lot of investment in these colleges, and we see our investment at great exposure. And we're not going to take it anymore. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do two things. He said, we've identified a handful of colleges that are the worst offenders, that continue to offer products that no one wants, that no one can afford. And we've, we've identified a handful of them. And the first thing we're going to do, two things. First thing we're going to do is we're going to sue the trustees of that university. And sue them for failure to perform their fiduciary responsibilities and oversee the management who's not been telling them the truth. He said, we know we're not going to get very far. That'll get on the Chronicle. That'll get in the New York Times. That's about all we're going to get. But here's what we're going to do with number two. He said, we're going to go and we're going to buy their bonds. Not all of them, but a majority of them. So that, again, that Taj Mahal at $100 million. So we'll buy their bonds at pennies in a dollar because their credit rating, like most institutions, have been lowered so much that they're junk bond status. So they'll buy a, a, a $100 million worth of, of bonds for, say, $60 million. Junk bond status. And as soon as they buy that, they knock on the president's door. Hello, Mr. President. Guess who your new boss is? Your landlord. Because you have violated multiple covenant agreements within that. And we have the right, under those loans, we have the right to enact change here. Now, the president may say, well, that's ridiculous. You're not going to enact change here. I don't. It would be like you not paying your taxes on your home mortgage. The bank has the right to call that note in. So, the, so these guys will say to the college, great, if you don't want to play, we have the right to bring in a, a, an external reform organization to help you reform your institution, to get back to exit one, if you will. But if you don't want to do that, Mr. President, that, that's fine with us. You know, guess, we bought it for $100 million. I tell you what, we know it's not worth really $100 million. We'll call it $60 million. So why don't you just write me a check right now for $60 million, we'll call it a day. Because we can call on that loan anytime we want, as China is doing with many European nations, by the way. The president doesn't have $60 million. What do you do? Oh, oh, I guess. So we go back to our first conversation, Mr. President, about what we need to do here as an institution. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe those days are coming, and we've got examples of that, because we pissed off parents. Remember the first chart? We pissed off the parents, because now it's coming out of their pocket. The lawmakers are responding to that, as they always will, so that they're coming up with their versions of how to fix the system. And now 
he pissed off the bankers. <laughs> you know, the bankers after you. So it is, it is this exit three, there is not much time. Mergers are possible. You're starting to see mergers. Georgia has been fighting mergers. New Jersey, one of our speakers, could not be here today. In New Jersey, he just acquired a community college at Rowan University. Just acquired a community college. The bondholders will demand restructuring. They're not going to lose their money. We're not playing with kids anymore. This is serious business, and they're not going to stand there. And you're going to lose significant control of your car, and they can do it because there'll be no choice. You may not hear about it because they don't want to go public, but it's going on. And this bank transaction, is, that's coming down to affect you. Excuse me? But I have reason to be optimistic. That's what I want to end with. <laughs> Told you. My wife likes to call it the, not the doom and gloom speech again. No, really. There's reasons to be optimistic here. And let me tell you why I'm, I'm optimistic. And I could not think of, of, of a better time to be in this, in this sector right now. Really, could not think of. And the reason why is, is because I know that the system's going to reset itself. And when it resets itself, it's going to come back stronger and better with better outcomes and better results for our kids, better results for our adults, and do I dare say better results for our nation. It's, going to re it's kind of like I tell folks in the office. It's, it's like when you're sitting around and you're on your windows, computer, and all of a sudden a little note comes up and says, you need to reboot your computer. Would you like to do it now or later? It's, oh, no. I'm in the middle of an email. Later. You hit it. Five minutes later, it comes back and says, you need to reboot your computer. Do you want to do it now or later? You're like, oh, I'm in the middle of an essay. Later, later. 20 minutes later, it comes back up again. Would you like to receive? And if you don't reboot your computer, what happens? Yeah, it crashes, right? Eventually it crashes or does it for you. We have hit that button for the last 25 years. And we need to now look at major reforms. We've got to get back to our campuses and talk about which road do we want to get off on. So I do think it's going to come back. I'm optimistic. There will be new models merging. I, could tell, I can't tell you the name, but there's a college not far from here that just got NIES, NIES approval for an amazing new degree offer, offering. And that is they're going to go and they're going to offer a, you know, the 120 semester hour I, I, uh, requirement, which many of you know dates back to 1906. has nothing to do with academics. Absolutely nothing to do with academics. It has to do with faculty pension plans in 1906 when that was created. That's going to come down. I believe it's going to come down. And I think it's going to come down. And what colleges are doing, this one college has got to prove they're going to offer a, they're still going to play within the 120 semesters, but they're going to have one course that's a four credit course. And they're going to offer that four credit course every four, how does this work? For every, every five weeks, you'll take one course, just one course. And then there'll be a small break. And if you, you, you have a small Christmas break and a very small summer break, you will get through 120 semester hours in three years. It's a very innovative three-year degree program. And they're going to charge under $10,000 for that. Now, I was at a college campus the other day. They offer a three-week course during the summer. Well, if you can teach it in three weeks, why can you teach it in five weeks? So you're going to see colleges that will, that will do this. I also think uh, not only will you see new models, I'll even go up on the crazy tree a little bit higher. I think, and don't hold me to this, but I think that at some point in time, when the states are no longer able to afford to give state institutions dollars because they're paying for health care, they're paying for prisons, they're paying for everything else, and many of them are at that point right now where they're at single digit uh, allocations. At some point in time, maybe in New Jersey, as you saw there, someone's going to say, that's it. We can't give you any more money. We've asked you to reform yourself. We've asked you to take exit one. We begged you to take exit two. And you flew right by exit three. That's it. We're done with you. We're going to sell you. We're going to sell you. Because, and we're going to go, and some private equity firm is going to come along and say, look, we'll give you $100 million for that college, and we guarantee you 5% of the tuition for the next 30 years. Is that so crazy? States have sold bridges. States have sold parks. States have sold uh, electric companies. It's a long history of states selling assets. We'll see what happens if they don't take that. So these new Merck models, not just academic models, but I think business models. There are some amazing joint ventures out there. You're going to have to form joint ventures with for-profit uh, uh, organizations, private equity organizations, you're, because that's where the capital is. You're going to need it. There is no cavalry coming from Trenton or from Albany, and certainly not from the federal government. 
And so where the money is right now is in the private equity sector. And I can see, as we saw with Laureate recently, you're going to see more and more of these joint ventures that will develop in their working partnerships to bring you the capital necessary to build the type of degree that students need. And I think ultimately technology will lead the way, whether it's an adaptive assessment, adaptive learning, new modes of technology. There is such an amazing assortment of up and coming ed tech companies out there. Uh, Wally Boston and I just recently served on a, uh, a business plan competition at Penn. And there were all these great little companies that have some amazing products that can fundamentally transform your institution. But up until now, what I like to call the, the higher education wall of arrogance never allowed those institutions to get over the wall. I mean, how many times has someone, you've seen a situation where a, a, someone has a great software program for predictive analytics, and the, and, and the company comes, and you sit in a faculty meeting, and someone says, oh, we don't need that. We've got Ted over there. Ted, show him your spreadsheet you created. We don't need you guys. You got me right there. Hey, thanks for the donuts. Good luck with that. That was five years ago. I think that wall is coming down and colleges are going to be looking for some of those companies that are out there to say, hey, can you come to our campus and talk to us a little about that? So I'm very optimistic. And the last slide I have for you is why I'm optimistic. It's because I think we have finally woken up. I think we have woken up as I think people see the handwriting on the wall. People are reading the story. The real question is, can we do it before they do it for us? So having said that, I see our Master of Ceremonies over there is about ready to pull a hook here and get me off of my beeping here. I want to stop. Do I have five minutes? All right, I want to stop there. I promised you before that this was my, my vision. By the way, I have a, a paper on a lot of this that hopefully will be published pretty soon, so in a, in a lot greater detail than I can get into in 30 minutes here. Uh, but, I, but this was my vision. This is my feeling of, of, of the challenges we face. We know that the road is not working for us. We know that there are exits. We have to have the courage to take those exits. I suggested to you some of them based on history. Um, and, and, and again, I'm wildly optimistic that, you, that colleges will take one of these exits. But let me stop there and see comments, thoughts. 